And while many members of our communities have lost their lives uh, uh, due to COVID or some other more familiar means, uh, disease, tragedy, or simply by our body is refusing to function. We have been ripped apart by a virus that has threatened every strand and fiber that has made us and us. It is these simple but profound facts that we hope gently to explore in this webinar series with theologians, historians, clergy, musicians, caregivers, and other practitioners. And to do this, I'm pleased to introduce a cherished colleague and mentor, Thomas, Dr. Thomas Long, who is Brandy, Brandy Professor Emeritus of Preaching at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University and author of the book, Accompany, him, Accompany Them with Singing, The Christian Funeral, published by Westminster John Knox Press. Dr. Long, uh, is serving as convener for these four sessions and will further introduce our panelists today. And together, toward the end of this session, we will invite your questions and comments in the Q&A function on your screen. And at the end, I'll come back on with a few more instructions for further sessions. I'll also direct you to the Institute's website, which is simply ism.yale.edu where you can track the content of both this session and the next three. So without further ado, let me introduce my colleague, Dr. Thomas Long. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I am Tom Long, and I'm privileged to serve as the moderator for these four webinars, all, all of them uh, dealing with accompanying the dying and the dead and the bereaved um, as they journey uh, in a time of grief and loss. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about this in terms of the impact of COVID, but it won't be entirely uh, addressed to the issue of COVID. Uh, COVID has taught us some new things, uh, but it's also reinforced some uh, things that we have known that are important about caregiving at this particular time. And we'll be lifting up those as well I think about uh, Drew Gilpin Faust's book, The Republic of Suffering. She's the former president of Harvard University and her book is about death and the Civil War. And it's how um, understandings theologically of death, uh, understandings of uh, dying and grief that once worked were overwhelmed by 500,000 dead on the battlefields of Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, and a time of mass death um, is a teacher in a stark and austere way, uh, clarifying things that are important, challenging uh, shallow understandings that we, that we once had. Um, the, the process we're going to use today is to allow each of our panelists to talk for a few minutes about their particular expertise and understanding of our issues. Um, and then uh, we're going to have some cross conversation among the panelists. And as Martin said, we invite you to participate in that. If you have questions or comments that you want to make along the way, use that Q&A button and we will be monitoring that and bringing some of those uh, comments and questions uh, to bear. Our particular topic today is accompanying the dying, those who are experiencing death and those who are around them, joining them uh, in their journey. Uh, one of the things that we all know is that because of the advancements in modern medicine, people are living longer today. What we sometimes don't acknowledge is that people are dying longer today as well. Uh, when our great-great-grandparents died, it was usually swiftly. Uh, they would die maybe in the field while they were working, or they would become gravely ill and would be taken, taken to their bedroom. And after a few days of being tended by family and visited by neighbors and friends, uh, they would die. Uh, of course, people still die swiftly in our own context, but it's not uncommon now 
for people to know that they are dying for weeks or months or, or even years. The journey is longer and in some ways uh, more complex. And one of the things that COVID has uh, reinforced about our understanding of that season of dying is that uh, if we know that it is not good at the beginning of life to be alone, it is also not good at the end of life uh, to be alone. We've, we've all been touched by the pictures in the news of ICU nurses holding cell phones with FaceTime so that uh, loved ones who cannot be present uh, in the hospital room can be there for the last few painful uh, breaths as someone whom they love uh, dies. And uh, this uh, being with and accompanying people as they are in the moment of death uh, is an extremely important activity. Uh, we often think of it in basically pastoral terms. How do we provide comfort? Uh, and that's uh, very important. But there are also liturgical components as well. There are rites and rituals uh, that are done. When uh, the theologian John Carmody was dying in a hospital of cancer, he said that a, a Catholic priest who just happened to be visiting some of his parishioners in the hospital was walking down the hospital corridor and saw John uh, in his bed and he stuck his head in his room and said, would you like to be anointed? He said it was a shocking question, and at first he didn't know how to respond to it, but something in him said, yes, I would. And he said the priest came over and uh, anointed him, and he said he counts it among the three or four most powerful uh, spiritual experiences uh, of his life. There are liturgical ritual things that are important here. Uh, but the season of dying is also a time for education and formation and theological reflection. W one of the oldest traditions in the Christian church uh, is called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying or the art of dying well. There was devotional literature that was written by Erasmus and others. And often this devotional literature uh, was in the form of a dialogue between a dying Christian and Satan. Uh, Satan was a pastoral counselor from hell, literally. And uh, Satan would put up all kinds of challenges. For example, um, in, in one example of this literature, Satan would say, you are frightened, aren't you? And the dying person's response was, Yes, I am, but I am comforted by the strength of God in Jesus Christ. Oh, strengthened are you, you who have no righteousness? Answer, I am not trusting in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. Well, thousands of demons are salivating for your soul. And I would be frightened, says the dying Christian, were it not for the fact that your tyranny had already been defeated. You can see what's happening. We're being trained with a vocabulary to encounter the season of death, a, a frame of thing uh, about death. There, there are many aspects to accompanying those who are dying, and that's our topic today. And we've assembled a marvelous panel to help us think this through. Our first panelist is uh, the Reverend Michael Lewis, who is a parish priest. He's parochial vicar of St. Mark's Catholic Church in El Paso, Texas, uh, an, a very large parish. Um, but in addition to that, he has had uh, some expertise in providing care to COVID patients. And he has thought so deeply about this. He's been instrumental in his diocese in training other priests in responding to this particular crisis. Uh, Michael, share with us your thinking about this important season in dying. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to all my uh, brothers and sisters who are part of this program and who are watching from uh, home or their offices today. 
when it when I uh, when the COVID uh, pandemic first hit, I was actually uh, in studies up in Chicago near Chicago, and um, obviously every like everything else, uh, the seminary shut down, and uh, I went back to El Paso to finish everything online. But the first thing that my bishop asked me to do was to um, consider. Uh, focusing my ministry since I was more or less an extra priest in the diocese at that point without an assignment uh, to focus my ministry on uh, in the hospitals. We didn't at this point know how bad the pandemic would be in El Paso uh, and as it would turn out it would be among the worst places uh, hit in the United States but um, I, I was eager to do it because I had had such a transformative experience doing my chaplaincy internship uh, at Children's Hospital in Dallas. Uh, specifically, I was the, uh, the ICU chaplain uh, in those days. When I accepted the, uh, the, the assignment, so to speak, I don't know if I had much of a choice, to be honest with you, uh, with your, when your bishop asks you to do something, but... Um, but I, I threw myself into the work, not really knowing what to expect. And for the first month or two, it was what I would call fairly routine hospital ministry. But as the pandemic drew longer, and especially as it became far more acute and um, began to infect and indeed uh, kill more people in El Paso, uh, it became uh, almost a triage of sort uh, triage of ministry in order to figure out which of the patients were the most at need of ministry in that moment for our limited resources. It wasn't until about November, December, January that the spike, as we call it here in El Paso, became um, overwhelming. And in those months, we were, uh, the entire city was overwhelmed. Our hospitals were uh, had, we're at 60% capacity, meaning 60% of all the patients in all the hospitals had COVID. Um, and indeed, we had completely uh, surpassed our capacity in our ICUs and in um, our hospitals to cover patients. So um, other teams, emergency medical teams were coming from outside of the, uh, the city and other parts of the state and other parts of the country uh, to create these hospital wards in, in tents because we did not have the hospital uh, capacity for them. So in those moments, that's when I think it finally, uh, you know, these things, I guess, happen gradually and then all at once where you suddenly realize what you're in the middle of. And I think for me, it was a moment when um, we were we were so overwhelmed that we didn't have enough medical personnel. So we were being supplemented by nurses and doctors from the Air Force. So on this particular day, I had been called to uh, the one of the COVID ICU rooms, which was the where the worst of the worst patients were. And while we had been allowed into the rooms with proper PPE, uh, to a certain extent in some of the hospitals. Other hospitals made us uh, minister from the other side of the glass of the ICU room door. Uh, but in this instance, the doctor who I would say blessedly did not understand the hospital's procedures um, invited us in, invited us priests into the room. And the reason why I never understood if he was actually Catholic or not, I don't think it really mattered in this instance, but he did have a great uh, appreciation for the role of pastoral care. And what he was doing is what we are trained to do as hospital chaplains, which is to advocate for the patient. And in this particular instance, he was faced with three people who were about to die that day and whose families were not allowed in to the room because of the infectious nature of the disease and who had been running Zoom conferences and FaceTime conferences with family members with you know, the, the, the iPad angle just so, so that they could see uh, their loved one. And in this case, he had three people who were dying that day and he didn't want them to die alone. So he called us there to be 
the surrogate for the patient's families, the surrogate for the patient's church, the surrogate for really, I also think the, the doctor because the doctor could be there at least in his ministerial role because he had to be there in order to withdraw care from this person. And, and I think in that moment, that was the first time that I literally saw somebody die in front of my face. And it's still moving to this day. But when I had to pull myself together then and multiple times since then was the sort of idea that uh, I need to be there to accompany this person as they journey from this life to the next. And essentially that's what I found myself doing the most over the last several months is trying to pull myself together so that I could be there for the dying person, but also for the dying family, uh, the, the dying person's family, but also not neglecting uh, a great deal of ministry to the workers themselves, the doctors and the nurses, because they need, and maybe even more so than anyone else, because they're surrounded by death and dying all day long. It just becomes overwhelming for anybody. We all are only human. But I think that leads me to another thing, and that's the idea of ministering to the minister. If anything, during this last uh, year of uh, acute and very focused ministry, where again, in a way that we're not used to, we're surrounded by death and dying. Um, it becomes very important to minister to the minister, to have the self-knowledge and self-awareness, to know that this is not normal and, and, and it's okay to say this is not normal. I know I've got some brother priests who were very much affected by this. And, and it became a, an issue where we had to uh, minister to each other and sort of say, you know, it's okay to seek help if that's what you need, but also to understand that it's okay to be affected by this. And um, as I've said before, we're not ministerial robots. If we were, we could just send in, I'm sure Jeff Bezos has already made it, or Elon Musk, and we can just send the anoint bot 3000 into the room instead of us. But the minister needs to be there and needs to be present. I think the final thing I wanted to touch on was just how much adjustment we had to make in these times of COVID to our normal processes and rituals. Um, I come from the Catholic tradition of which there's a ritual for everything, and certainly even for the sick and for the dying. But the central uh, ritual of our, uh, what used to be colloquially known as last rites, but uh, we understand as the sacrament of anointing of the sick, is anointing with the uh, oil of the sick on the forehead and on the hands. Well, how do you do that? How do you, how do you minister a sacrament of the church that has a prescribed ritual and a prescribed way of doing celebrating the right to be valid when you cannot separate the anointing from the minister? And that was probably the hardest thing to do, was trying to figure out how can we uh, pray the fullness of our church's rites and prayers and rituals for somebody when we are physically prevented from doing so. And I have to admit, Lord forgive me, I uh, ignored the uh, rules of the hospitals a couple times to sneak into rooms so that I could do it, but never without, you know, keeping myself protected and safe. Um, but that was one of the things. The other one was, of course, just not having the family present, you know. And I think in all of the history of the church, I know that's the third topic uh, point, but in all the history of the church, it's always been about the family being there to, to, to accompany their loved one as they go and enter this, this, this final stage, this final act of transformation. Uh, but what we were focused on was having to deal with Zoom and deal with FaceTime. So uh, having to become almost a video producer at the same time when we were trying to do the rise of the dying, uh, became another skill that we had to uh, adapt with. But I think what was important was that we were able to adapt and, and even the church was able to adapt with it and sort of made uh, adjustments and accommodations for what couldn't happen just by virtue of the fact that uh, of the infectious nature of this. But we were able to do it because again, 
we were human ministers doing the ministry. I think we were able to adapt in a way that robots or machines could never do so. And we were able to provide everything that that person needed uh, as they approached the end of their life, at least the end of their earthly life. So, uh, you know, I'm still ministering to COVID patients, uh, though thankfully not as often. Um, I saw a COVID patient just uh, the other day, and it was similar situations, but um, the level of heightened sensitivity, heightened uh, awareness, hyper activity has, has thankfully and blessedly uh, decreased. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thanks, Michael. I, I think. Um a lot of us have had the experience that you were describing of we're, we're given a set of rules by the hospital or the church or whatever and yet the real circumstances there right before us uh, sometimes call for audible on the field we have to <laughs> do, do something that's different because of the human need that's uh, that's there our uh, second panelist is Jennifer Hollis. She's a, a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. Um, she's an author. She's written a marvelous book called Music at the End, uh, Easing the Pain and Preparing the Passage. She's a music thanatologist. Um, that is to say someone who has thought deeply and studied about the relationship between uh, music and the event of dying and the care of those who are dying. She's the project director of an organization called Harps of Comfort, and uh, they have been called to the front lines during COVID to provide live music uh, through electronic means uh, to those who are dying. Jennifer, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, tell us something of how you see the care of those who are in the process of dying. Certainly, um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, it's such an important topic accompanying the dying and one that's very close to my heart and has been for uh, quite a while. Um, I thought what I would do is just a brief introduction to music thanatology um, because I'm sure it's a word that many of you haven't heard of and that's fine, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about how we pivoted from literally bringing harps to the bedside of dying patients to um, having to do a lot over iPads and Zoom. Um, and then I'd like to just briefly play a little bit of recorded music, maybe in the spirit of um, ministering to the ministers, just having some music together. Uh, but I want to start with a quotation that I love from an essay by Parker J. Palmer called the gift of presence, the perils of advice. And when I think about accompanying the dying, um, this, this idea that he offers here kind of frames the core of why it's so uh, important to me. He writes, here's the deal. The human soul doesn't wanna be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed, to be seen, heard and companioned exactly where it is. When we make that kind of deep bow to the soul of a suffering person, our respect reinforces the soul's healing resources, the only resources that can help the sufferer make it through. So music thanatology is a, is a musical and clinical modality. And as I say, we, we, used, we used live harp and vocal music right at the bedside with patients to serve their physical and emotional and spiritual needs, um, and also to care for their loved ones and by extension for the medical caregivers around them. Um, we use what we call prescriptive music. So prescriptive music is live music that responds to the physiological needs of the patient. So rather than playing maybe a familiar song that they might know or something that maybe was played at their wedding, um, we observe their vital signs, you know, their heart rate, their respiration, the temperature, any signs of pain or discomfort. And then because we're right there watching them and observing them, we can kind of individually tailor the music to whatever is happening and really accompany the process that's unfolding in front of us. You typically starting with the breath. So breath by breath, we can use the music um, to 
support the process that's happening. Um, our hope, of course, is that this will relieve suffering. And what we observe is that sometimes this is physical suffering, like restlessness, agitation, sleeplessness, labored breathing. Um, and it also, uh, we hope, offers a calm, soothing environment for people to rest in, to do that kind of difficult work of letting go of their lives, saying goodbye to the people around them. Um, the music mediates that connection. And I think music thanatology is particularly important for folks who maybe have trouble expressing those kinds of things in words. The music um, allows them to have a space to rest in. It kind of changes the environment that they're in. That busy, busy, loud ICU after a few minutes of music, people are transported. It's a different kind of space. And so whatever work that particular patient needs to do, um, our, our hope is that the music allows them to get closer to doing that. Um, there, music thanatology is a small field. There are about 100 practitioners in the world, and we have a shared training and certification. Um, as many, many people watching this know, um, there are lots of musicians in medical settings. There are music therapists and therapeutic musicians and volunteer musicians and concert performers who bring their talents into the hospital setting. And I would say the kind of slice that music thanatology addresses is um, really end of life care and, and caring for people with music, with serious illness, providing one-on-one -on -one music for people, um, using music in a prescriptive way. And we really see our work as a combination of beautiful music and this kind of deep bow that uh, Parker Palmer talks about, this deep compassionate presence that witnesses the dying patient right where they are, right right in that moment. Um, so I first encountered music thanatology as an undergraduate, if you can believe that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I attended a, a training in Montana and um, I did an internship in Oregon and I used to work for a hospice in Chicago. And for the past 15 years, I've been working with a palliative care team at Leahy Hospital outside Boston. So that was sort of my life in music thanatology um, and then March of 2020 happened and uh, I couldn't go to the hospital with my harp anymore. And so something had to change. And um, like, you know, so many of us the we could see the need, the profound need for accompaniment on the news stories. And we could see it on the faces of um, nurses being interviewed and from hospitals. And um, I knew, and my colleagues knew that music thanatology had a practice that would really serve in this moment, this playing music for dying patients. Um, and we had the knowledge and experience of, of this kind of accompaniment. Many of my colleagues had been doing this kind of work for decades. So we had lots of experience that um, of the efficacy of music, um, but we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it in the way we had thought that we would had done it in the past. So um, you'll never believe this, but on the last day of March last year, I got a tweet from a physician in Milwaukee, Dr. Jennifer McKinnon, who just said, I'm a harpist and a doctor, and I'd like to work with you to help bring music into the ICUs to help patients who are dying alone. So let's work together. Um, and so I know a sign when I see one. So <laughs> I gave her a call and we talked about what it would be like to pivot from this live music to um, what so many ministers have had to do is more work on a screen. And we created uh, Harps of Comfort. I invited my music thanatology colleagues and other therapeutic musicians I knew. And we just week by week by week started having conversations about how we could become agile with the technology we needed, how we could develop a referral process um, that was compliant with hospital policies and how we could fit into the routines of increasingly busy ICUs, even though we were going to need more help to do this work because we needed someone to send us a link and we needed someone to bring the iPad into the patient. And so um, we had a lot to navigate, but we had a really clear vision that music could help in these moments. So we just kept Kind of working together and um, I think for the for all of us working together it was um, a really meaningful way to deepen our work um, in this new um, situation with the COVID-19 uh, 
crisis. So we created Harps of Comfort. We continued to work with Dr. McKinnon. And in September, um, we began offering these live remote music sessions for patients in an ICU at Freighter Hospital in Milwaukee. And now um, I function as the project director. There are six or seven harpists on call each weekday. And the nurses in that unit do do all the coordinating. They send us a link, they position the iPad. And even though the harpists are all across the country and the patients are all in this ICU in Milwaukee, both of them, both the harpist and the patient report um, a real intimacy with the music. And the nurses have talked about um, just the same thing that we saw in live music, that um, breathing patterns are eased, uh, some patients who've been having trouble sleeping and are agitated are able to rest. People who are awake, you know, are feel grateful and it's something to look forward to. And even patients under heavy sedation, their loved ones have reported that um, their blood pressure has come down a little and their breathing is eased. So, you know, before this, I think I might have said that um, the best the best case scenario would be to be there in person and play live music and to be able to see and feel everything in the room. And that playing a CD, for example, or some kind of recorded music um, wouldn't be the same. But now that we've experienced this, I feel like this live virtual music is something different than both of those things. And uh, it's neither better nor worse. It's, it's its own experience. And that's really something that I didn't anticipate. And I think going forward, you know, we will continue to serve uh, COVID patients, and we do, but also patients with serious illness and patients who are isolated in other ways for whom we might never have been able to bring a harp into the room, but they might um, accept a, a visit if it's on an electronic device. So I feel like the opportunities that we have to accompany the dying have actually grown um, because we were forced to kind of, you know, make this pivot. Um, so I wanted to end just by sharing a little bit of music and maybe um, all of us kind of watching this could get a little bit of an experience of what music on a screen feels like and looks like. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share the Harps of Comfort website and you'll see uh, that there are five videos of harp music paired with natural images and all of you are welcome to um, listen to them, share them with people. If there's anyone you feel like could benefit from some quiet music and some beautiful natural images, they just live on this website. So feel free to just enjoy. So I'm going to play a little sample. Um, this is a song called The Ferryman by um, my colleague Peter Roberts, who's an Australian music thanatologist. And the filmmaking is um, by a filmmaker named uh, Arshida Klagi. So I'm going to share my screen um, and just show you. Oh. So this is the website where you can find these videos. You just go to the Heart videos. And then this is from something called the sanctuary. And I'll just play a little bit. Thank you. 
So thank you. I look forward to talking to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, you made me think about a couple of things as you were uh, talking. I was thinking about the small chamber or orchestras that would uh, get on balconies outside of hospitals and serenade the staff as they uh, left after a long shift of attending COVID patients. And so the music is not only for the dying, but for those who are uh, accompanying uh, the dying. I also think about a, a longtime colleague of ours at Emory University who um, died of a cognitive disorder in a facility that dealt with that. And uh, as he was dying, his family was gathered around his bed and um, being with him. And then when he died, they had arrangements. He was donating his body to Emory University Hospital. They called the hospital to send the van to come get the body. And when the attendants came and put his body on a gurney to take him out to the van. They followed the gurney as it went to the van and they were shocked to find the staff of the facility lining the hospital corridor on both sides singing Amazing Grace and It Is Well With My Soul. Um, the power of music in a time of uh, transition. Um, I live in mural, uh, rural Maryland, and I want to ask you later about um, how the oodles of little churches in our area and, and, and small hospitals that we have, how the, uh, the music that you offer uh, can be brought in uh, more homemade ways into uh, smaller kinds of settings. Uh, our uh, third panelist is James Abington, who was a colleague of mine at Candler School of Theology. Um, he is a well-loved and well-renowned professor of worship and music, and he is particularly a specialist in the African-American uh, church music repertoire. He um, has edited a number of collections of uh, African-American uh, hymns and anthems, old and new. Uh, he is an organist extraordinaire, and uh, one great credential he brings to this conversation is that he was the organist at the funeral for Hank Aaron, the legendary baseball player in, in, in Atlanta. Uh, Jimmy, we're glad to have you with us. Tell us what you have to say about this topic. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you uh, to uh, Martin, Jean, and the uh, Yale ISM committee for inviting me to be a part of this and to uh, share these uh, wonderful colleagues that I've just met on this panel who are doing such wonderful things. Um, I want to speak more as a practitioner from the church about some of the practices that many people are involved in as individuals. Um, I have been involved in some of the few practices that were pre-COVID uh, where we attempt to minister to the aging and the dying. Uh, one of those were choirs going to nursing homes or hospice or senior citizens facilities uh, and singing hymns and having sing along with patients in those uh, facilities. Of course, COVID uh, removed that option from accompanying uh, the, 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 the dying. Uh, a second one was certainly just small groups, a soloist, two or three, sometimes a quartet of people that would go to the hospital bed or to the homes of the dying. And uh, many of them would be members of the church choir or members of certain organizations that members had been a part of. And they would sing their favorite hymns or read their favorite uh, passages of scripture, particularly the Psalms. And um, again, uh, the, the COVID uh, crisis uh, eliminated that kind of in-home visitation and opportunity to accompany people. Finally, one that I have found to be uh, most uh, practical and uh, that has been safe over the years has been sending, uh, as I think has been said, uh, doing videos, uh, Zoom 
meetings uh, or, or sending portions of worship services, in particularly uh, to members of uh, my congregation. Uh, it just does not seem real that we have not assembled since March of 2020. Uh, we have done live streaming and we've shown videos and many of members of the church really appreciate seeing each other in those ways. Uh, or we uh, have uh, occasionally had uh, uh, the uh, uh, up to an octet of singers who would go in and record music for the live streamings. I've been very sensitive during that time to those beloved hymns as well as the choral anthems of the church that people want to hear, that uh, it's kind of the people's choice of music, many of them who are elderly and who are dying and who have passed away. And uh, many of them uh, will say, when I die, I want that hymn, or I want that song, or I want you to play uh, so and so and so and so. So I've kept those things tucked away and felt that it was kind of my pastoral duty as uh, music director to feed those with that time, and particularly a very dear uh, lady in our church who just passed early this month. She had been suffering, uh, well, she was in fourth stage lung uh, cancer. Uh, she had uh, had some other pre-existing positions in addition to having a hip replacement and was taking care of her husband who was suffering with Alzheimer's who passed during COVID. And um, she was a woman of great strength and she loved music. Uh, she and her husband uh, had been involved in church music ministry, retired and had just uh, relocated to Atlanta. But uh, music was very important to them. And her husband had participated in the choir. Uh, unfortunately, he was not able to because of COVID. And of course, as his uh, mental uh, capacity began to deteriorate, he was not able to do that but uh, he knew the songs that he loved. And so we often would send clips of things that the choir had sung that he liked and she would tell me about how he responded to those. And I um, then would do the same after uh, he passed for her because she seemed to be suffering and the one who had been the caregiver was now uh, on her journey uh, to, uh, to her eternal rest. And occasionally I would send things and just really uh, try to remember from conversations or occasionally I would send clips to her by uh, cell phone video, just to send her a text. Uh, one I sent her, I'll never forget, was a recording of Mahalia Jackson singing, You Can't Hurry God. Um, it's a text, you can't hurry God, you can't hurry God. No, you've just got to wait. You've got to trust him and give him time no matter how long it takes. He's a God you can't hurry, he'll be there. Don't you worry, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. And I sent that to her and she texted me back saying, I don't believe that you knew that was my mother's favorite song and she wanted to hear that until uh, the day she passed. And there were other recordings that I would share with her and things that became just her own personal devotions. And we would talk on the phone, but as her voice and she was unable to talk because of lung cancer, um, it, uh, it became a personal ministry. And as I went back through my phone and saw the many exchanges that we had, uh, I felt good. And one of the messages that she said was, thank you for accompanying me on my journey home. And um, that became my personal ministry. I want to talk about another situation, uh, personal experience from my uncle who uh, pastored a church in Bluefield, West Virginia uh, for 67 years, who in the latter part of his life uh, uh, was struck with a lot of illnesses uh, uh, that uh, just made it impossible for him to be regular, but he pastored. Uh, literally up until the time that he passed away. But in Thanksgiving of 2019, we knew that it was time for us as a family to go to be with him because uh, we were being told that this probably would be his last uh, Thanksgiving with us. And as much as we did not want to accept that, we all made the sacrifice and we did go. And uh, so glad that we did because when we got there, of course, uh, 
uh, we discovered the Uncle Clarence that we all knew and all loved. And although he was in the bed and unable to do a lot of things, he wanted singing. He wanted to hear. He recalled a lot of experiences from churches. Do you remember brother so-and-so? Do you remember sister so-and-so? And we would sit around and talk. But then he said, okay, I want you all to sing. I want to hear this. He says, I want to hear this while I can hear it now. He said, and don't worry about me. I, but I, you know, and when I had with my home going, I want you to sing these songs. And surely enough, you know, he, uh, at age 18, he began working at the U.S. Steel coal mines in Gary and continued for 21 years, even though he was a minister. So it was amazing that one of his favorite hymns was <laughs> a uh, kind of a, a, a gospel song era song called "Life Is Like a Mountain Railroad." And uh, he, he wanted to hear that song, The Uncloudy Day, uh, Charles Tinley's The Storm is Passing Over, uh, Down at the Cross, uh, When We All Get to Heaven, Fare You Well If I Never Ever See You Anymore. We sang these and he would sometimes ask for them over and over and over until he just would go to sleep. And we were all singing around the bed. Side. And he wanted to hear those at his funeral. He said, I won't hear them at the funeral, but I want people to know that this is what I heard as I was on my journey. And sure enough, he passed on New Year's Day, 2020. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that before he passed. Finally, I want to tell a story that I think um, is one of the most meaningful examples of accompanying uh, those that have been special to us uh, in their final days. And it is a story that was is told quite uh, a few times in sermons of the uh, pastor emeritus of the Hartford Memorial Baptist Church in Detroit, Charles G. Adams, where I served for many years. And he would often climax his sermons with this story of his relationship with his former uh, Sunday school teacher, Mother Burke. Uh, Mother Burke had been his uh, Sunday school teacher since he was a little kid and grew up growing up in the church and, of course, was one that always kept in touch with him and encouraged him. Uh, Mother Burke had become very ill and she'd been hospitalized for quite a while. and She'd lost a lot of weight and um, teeth were more out than in. And, uh, she had gone blind and eventually they had to put her in a nursing home. She was not expected to live much longer and reluctantly and half-heartedly, Reverend Adams says, he finally decided to go see her, but he really did not want to see this strong towering figure in the state that she had deteriorated, but he knew that he had to go to, do, to visit her. When he entered the room, he called her name and she immediately smiled, he said, and sat up and said, there's my pastor and former Sunday school teacher, Charles. And after a long visit and before he was about to leave and pray, he said, Mother Burke, I have my Bible with me. Would you like for me to read a scripture to you before I leave? To which she responded, son, I may be blind now and cannot see, but while I could, I memorized and tucked away scriptures for a day just like today. If you just give me the letters of the alphabets, I'll quote the scripture to you. So he said, A. She replied, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. He said, B. She replied, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He said, C. She replied, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. He said, D, Mother Burke. She said, deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. He said, E, Mother Burke. She said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. So F, G, so it went on and on. And after exhausting all 26 letters of the alphabets and holy scriptures, that Mother Burke had committed to memory. He declared that the visit had done more for him than he was sure that it did for her. So in conclusion, I say that while we are accompanying the dying to their eternal rest, we cherish the times we have had with them and for the time that we still have. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, uh, you, you make me think about 
um, how uh, we, we often think that it's the professionals who gather around those who are dying, who provide the comfort and care. And that's important. It's, we've all been inspired by ICU nurses and physicians and others who've been brave in this uh, time of COVID. But we know in our DNA that we need the whole community uh, around us. And um, a good bit of the research indicates that people know they want to be and ought to be around those who are dying, but they fear to be uh, around those who are dying. And they, one of the fears is they don't know what to do and they don't know what to, what to say. Um, and I'm wondering if, uh, not just you, Jimmy, but all of us, if we could think about, are there ways that we can equip the whole community uh, to be caregivers to those who are in the process of dying? I really think that demystifying death is something that I think needs to be part of our, our Christian formation, no matter what church we're part of, because there's... Um, there's still such a stigma around death and the dying uh, that you're right. There are a lot of people that don't want to have anything to do with somebody who's dying. Um, let me know when she's dead and then I'll come and visit her. And part of that says, I think more about ourselves and about maybe our own fears about death than it says about how much we want to be there for our loved one. But I just had a, a powerful experience on Saturday when I was called to the bedside of a patient, not a COVID patient, but when I arrived, it was at the moment of death. And uh, the, the, the patient's husband was there along with the daughter and they had clearly come to a peace. They had, they had probably accompanied their mother, their wife for weeks, if not months of, of debilitating illness. So they had probably come to a sense of peace and maybe even gratitude that, that, that she was no longer suffering. But as I was in the middle of the rites, um, other family members came, including a niece, and she was inconsolable, inconsolable, was screaming, why God, why God, why God? And part of me was thinking, why is she only being allowed in now? You know, maybe if she had been allowed in earlier, she would be able to come to have that same sense of peace and understanding that this is this is something that we are all going to have to deal with, um, you know, and, but, but I also was also faced with a sense of, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, a sense of helplessness as a minister, because there was nothing I could do to help this poor woman in her anguish and her grief. And, and there, there always is a sense of awkwardness, I think, for anybody who ministers to the dying, um, that is just part and parcel of the vocation, I think. You know, Mike, that sense of helplessness, there's nothing I can do. I, I think we've all felt that um, in the face of dying. And I, I, it seems that one of the great learnings that we've had is that, that that's okay. Being there and not knowing what to say or do is um, a, a, an appropriately human response to the mystery of death. I think we're also thinking today about the repertoire of things that we can uh, do that we don't have to make up on the spot. Um, I, I worshiped at a church in Atlanta where the choir master would on Wednesday night choir practice take all or part of the choir to hospice whenever there was a member of the congregation in hospice and they would just do choir practice in the hospice uh, lobby with the permission of the family and the uh, facility, of course, but ju just to practice the hymns of the of the church um, in the presence of those who are dying is a, a contribution. Um, Jennifer, you gave us some really beautiful uh, examples of the way you bring music into engagement with the dying, and I'm wondering if there's some some ways that those of us who who might not have access to the wonderful resources that you have, but um, just have sort of ordinary, ordinary resources might, uh, might respond and ways of musical care. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, 
this is sort of the challenge of having this special training and this special word. And, uh, you know, I think like music thanatology, it sounds like you have to have some kind of qualification, but the truth is, you know, I witness family members, patients, loved ones improvising their way through these moments together. Um, because all of us sort of long to do a good job in these moments. You know, we all know that this is a tender, special time. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things we can all do is challenge ourselves to, you know, reflect on death and dying, reflect on our own death, prepare, um, educate ourselves a little bit about things like hospice and advanced directives and um, think about our own funerals, what music is special to us, maybe articulate a little bit of that to our family members um, and uh, practice a little bit of that kind of improvisation. You know, if when we visit people in the hospital, maybe if we play an instrument, bring an instrument. If we don't, bring a Spotify playlist, you know, bring a little, some kind of recorded music that's precious to you, share it with someone, you know, if you feel very, very brave, you know, sing to someone who, who feels, um, you know, like they're suffering, you know, that it's very intimate, but also it's very intuitive. You know, I feel like all of us will scoop up a fussy child and bounce it and hum and sing, you know, and people who are suffering at all stages of life benefit from that. But I think, you know, it's easy to feel like, oh, I don't have a very good singing voice or, oh, my, my guitar doesn't sound very good. But I think that kind of, just like conversation, just like bringing food, just like bringing flowers, um, challenging ourselves to just get over maybe a little embarrassment or fear and share a little bit of music with people who are suffering, um, I think can benefit everyone, you know? And then if we do it a little bit ahead of time in those, mo in those crisis moments, we will have a little bit of experience to inform what to do. And we'll be, our improvisation will be a little bit better informed. You make me uh, think, and this connects with what you said, Jimmy. Um, a number of years ago, right after I had lost my mother, uh, who died in hospice, I happened to be at a Lutheran conference and found myself at the dinner table with a Lutheran layperson. We got to talking about things, and we discovered that we had both just lost our mothers in hospice after being in hospice for a couple of weeks. And I said to him, you know, there's that awkward time in hospice when you've said all the things that you feel like you need to say. Um, to the one you're losing. Um, I love you. You don't want to keep saying these because it cheapens it if you just keep saying it over and over and a kind of silence falls over the room. He said, that happened to me. He said, I was with my two sisters and my teenage son and we were keeping vigil with my mother and there was this awkward silence in the room and said, suddenly my sister started singing A Mighty Fortress. <laughs> and uh, he said we were all Lutherans we knew it so we started <laughs> singing with her and then when she finished that one we sang another Lutheran hymn and another and another he said it dawned on me this is why we learn these hymns for a moment like this Absolutely. he said I turned to my teenage son who is not into church and I said look I'm not trying to crimp your style but you've got to learn these hymns <laughs> <laughs> because one day you're going to sing them over over me and it made me think about the power of memory in, in music and the power of memory when people are dying, there are precious memories that they hold on to. But also you said, not necessarily, Jennifer, you said not necessarily the familiar hymn, but sometimes the, um, the new thing that responds to the rhythms and, and that blend of, of newness and familiarity of memory and hope. Uh, what, what about that in, in the kind of care we give uh, at the time of dying? It's a good question. I, I feel like it's a very, um, it's kind of part of the assessment and reflection and pastoral care uh, that we, you know, offer in the moment. There are patients that um, really want to hear certain songs. And if we know them, we certainly play them. But the heart of what we do is, is playing music to kind of accompany um, this end of life dying process and to hold that kind of contemplative space for people. So um, 
I, I think of the, the kind of music that we play as kind of a, a container that in some ways actually isn't the centerpiece of what's happening. The patient and the family is really the centerpiece and we're a little bit off to the side. It isn't, a. I always tell people, it's not a performance. You don't have to behave yourself. You can just interrupt me if, if you need something. We don't, you know, you don't have to wait for the end of the song. You can just let me know. Um, but there's space, you know, there's so much space in that process for both the familiar and the unfamiliar, the singing together and the accompaniment from outside. There's all of those component parts, I think, fit into the dying process, depending on kind of where you are and who you are. The physician Lewis Thomas, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Lives of a Cell, also wrote a book about being a physician. He's a teaching physician at one of the hospitals in New York City. And he said this interesting thing about young physicians. He said, young physicians are the best trained in the history of the profession, but they lack two things. First of all, they've never been sick. Not really, not sick unto death. Uh, and they don't know what it feels like to be facing death uh, in their own patients. And the second is they have forgotten that the centerpiece of healing is touch. Um, they go to their screens and look at the data results uh, of the test, but to put your hands uh, on someone who is sick or dying uh, is the therapeutic uh, process. And I wonder about the roles of empathy and touch, and especially COVID has deprived us of, not of our empathy, but uh, often of our touch and our how do we how do we compensate for our inability to to touch i think it's what you said it's it's sort of the when one of the senses has to decrease then the other ones have to come up and, and take its place so certainly if if touch is not possible then you know sound and music certainly is a, is a great way uh to to affect that or, or arouse that sense uh, in somebody. Um, you know, I know that there was, there's times when, I, again, I'm not allowed, I wasn't allowed into a room because of the COVID restrictions, um, but they allowed me to open the, the door a crack and to project my voice, um, you know, and my bishop was, was content with, if, if I couldn't, um, affect the forgiveness of sins through the sacrament of anointing of the sick, then I could um, almost shout the, uh, the formula of absolution as long as the person was able to hear me and that could affect uh, forgiveness of sins that way. But that was sort of the, the things that we had to, you know, as one thing decreased, we had to increase other things in order to, to help. I know even the visual media was, was also helpful. So where, um, where we couldn't be in a room, we would try to, you know, they, I know the nurses would try to uh, change the lighting so that it would be less harsh, less institutional, less antiseptic in a certain sense. Um, and I know that was, was helpful for, for a lot of, of patients, but, you know, I, I, and I think one of the other things you mentioned was about memory. And I think both what Jimmy said and what Jennifer said, you know, it's these things that help recall a memory in somebody. And, and one of the things I've, I'm sure you've encountered Jennifer and Jimmy too, is the sense of the familiar becomes very comforting, even to people who are not conscious. And I'm sure you've experienced probably those, those similar things. Yeah, and I, th I think also in terms of empathy, it, hel it helps that those of us who tend to the dying have had experience of tending to the dying we are not afraid of the experience of dying. Um, I think Eric Erickson once said, if we can have adults who don't fear death, we can have children who don't fear life. And I think that when the caregivers bring, I've been down this path before with others and now I come and walk this path with you, that that's a powerful asset to bring. And that we're touched by the fact that we weep while we walk uh, with them is a, a one asset. We're just about out of time, and Martin, I want to make sure if we've got, uh, if there are questions from 
the participants that we don't want to overlook those anything that we should respond? yeah there there are there are a few here tom thanks and uh, uh participants i'm i'm I, or our audience members i'm sorry we have to keep this kind of locked down but uh, unfortunately we had a bad experience with some zoom bombing a couple of uh, months ago and so we've been advised to filter ways that uh, these kind of comments are 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 transmitted uh one one person uh um <clears throat> puts a uh, puts in front of us a, a group called the threshold choir uh which uh, sings at the bed bedside of dying uh persons not maybe unlike uh the uh um, the group that Jennifer is uh, involved with. Um, uh, two, two ones that I want to get to here, though. Uh, one, one person uh, says that in her upbringing and training, perhaps in her formation, she was told that it's best not to sing at a dying person's bedside as it only arouses, it only arouses the person. And uh, I wonder if anyone wants to comment on that. And then I'll switch to a second one in a minute. I think my first my first thing is always talk to the nurse. <laughs> always talk to the nurse. That is the, the number one rule of doing any kind of ministry, whether it's in a hospital setting, a nursing home, even home hospice. Always talk to the nurse. You may not be aware of unique situations going on there, and uh, the nurse will tell you, yeah, it's probably not a good thing. She gets agitated when such and such, you know, maybe not do this. Or probably like, no, sing away. I'm sure she, she'd love that, you know. So I think if you talk to the nurse, every situation is, is, is different. Uh, but that nurse has been with this patient for a while and, and really knows. My sister, the nurse, would love that answer, uh, Father Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Any, anyone else have a? Well, I think one of the Proverbs, I won't quote it exactly, but it says something like, only a fool would sing to the sad. Uh, and I, I think what that means is, that if we are singing to correct somebody's experience, it's an unwelcome intrusion. If we're singing out of somebody's experience and to give context to someone's experience, um, then, I, then I think we are supporting and, ac and accompanying, which is the goal of our ministries. That's excellent. I, I, I agree with that. You know, it's been said particularly of dementia and Alzheimer's patients that in many cases, they may not recognize, they may not know, they may not speak, but if they hear a familiar psalm or a song that they have memorized, they can sing it, will sing it all the way through, you know, to the last stanza, uh, but then may not know the very people they're talking with. So that memory of those kinds of things can be very healthy and very vital in those transitional moments. Excellent. Let me just get to the second and, and perhaps last question today. And this is kind of aimed at Father Mike, but maybe others would have a, uh, a comment as well. This person uh, identifies as female, uh, non-Catholic hospice, hospice chaplain. And there've been many times when uh, in, in her experience, families request a Catholic priest to perform the anointing of the sick, uh, but I'm unable to get a priest to come out due to COVID restrictions. I offer to give a blessing and anointing instead of the family is interested. Do you have any advice on how to comfort families who want to see a priest, but can't get one? Yeah, that, that's out of your head, it's a familiar question. Well, yeah, well, especially here on the border, which is overwhelmingly Catholic and, um, and Mexican American uh, by extraction and ancestry. So we get a lot of requests for Los Olios, Los Olios. Uh, it's not for the sacrament, it's not for uh, last rites or anything else. It's just Los Olios. And what they're asking for is the anointing. And, and of course, according to our tradition, that's only can be done by, by a Catholic priest. But like you've experienced, and, and even during the, the worst times of the COVID uh, situation here, we couldn't get to all the, all the dying patients. Um, so on one hand, we, we try to form our people by re reminding them not to wait until the last moment. Uh, they're not called last rites anymore for a reason. And that is we, 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 they're, the sacrament can be celebrated at all stages of illness. Um, and it's just as good uh, earlier in illness as it is in, in the moments before you know, preceding death. But, you know, I also would, you know, encourage her maybe to, without over explaining, because I know that can be a danger, especially for uh, us, us theologians, but, 
you know, the Vatican has made uh, some concessions, I don't want to say concessions, but adaptations uh, to the rights, but also to uh, explain to people that there are certain indulgences and certain graces that are attached uh, at the moment of death, even if a priest cannot be present, because, you know, there are only so many priests out there, and certainly there are more people dying anyways every day than there are priests that can attend to them. And this has always been the teaching of, uh, of our tradition, is that, you know, the Lord will provide, the church will provide, the church will provide the prayers for your loved one, but ultimately, we all depend on the mercy of God. Um, and I think if the good intention was there, Certainly, I think your prayers um, are worthwhile uh, and are helping that person make that transition from death uh, into new life. And Martin, the last word is yours. <laughs> well, just let me add my thanks uh, to uh, everyone's here and many of the comments that have come through over the transom are, are exactly that, words of thanks and appreciation for your participation here. Uh, today, dear panelists, uh, some of uh, whom we will see again, uh, uh, Jennifer Hollis, especially, it's been a great pleasure and honor to welcome you, and I hope it's not the last time that uh, our paths uh, cross here at the ISM. Uh, our second session is uh, under the topic, Memorializing the, the Dead, and that will take place this Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, if you've already registered, if you if you're here uh, currently in this session, you have registered for all four sessions, so you need not register again. Uh, you will be you will receive, I believe, a reminder uh, with the link uh, 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 one day before uh, the um, uh, the session begins on Thursday, and so look out for that. And if you have any questions, just uh, write to the ISM general website. Uh, at ism.yale.edu. And uh, until then, I'll, I'll say thank you again to Jimmy and Tom and Father Mike and Jennifer for your participation today and look forward to seeing everybody Thursday at 4 p.m. Thank you.